So that's what I'm looking for. Um, I thank you for the opportunity, Regina. Thank you, Henry, for raising some of the issues for us to consider as civil society. And I know this did, did not miss out on yesterday's discussion, as well as, of course, the discussions ahead on how we can ably and effectively track the revenue that's coming from the DT economy. It's not easy, but it's possible. And what are some of the measures that we could take? We could take baby steps, but as long as we, we get there, it's small portion is better than nothing at the end of the day, as we come look at other strategies for maximizing uh, generating this revenue. I know Silva has joined us. You can see how to make him a co-host so that he can share his presentation. Silva, are you ready? Uh, yes, uh, I am. Let me see. We are just, um, it was just a recap of what we learned this thing, what maybe what we want to see going forward, ideally. Please share the presentation and over to you. All right, uh, thank you. I think let me just. In the meantime, you could type your questions as he We can see how to get back to them and encourage most of us to, to mute so that we can listen to them. Uh, okay, so I'll be sharing this shortly. Um, it's just loading. Okay, so uh, yeah, are we able to see all of us? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Henry, you hand is still we up. Should, we should be able to see it right now. Yeah. Loading. All right. All right. Um, okay. So, good, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I see someone. Let me admit them, Albert. So, uh, colleagues, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Apologies, I'm joining late. I think I had got communication wrong. I thought I'm, I'm to present at 3.30. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we okay to start. So I was asked to speak uh, something on understanding financial technology in Africa. However, I must admit that Africa is not one homogeneous entity. This is a collection of over 50 countries. And so various practices and nuances might really be different. Uh, but I'll try to talk about some of the general themes that are coming up and where need be, we shall contextualize the discussion to those specific aspects. Uh, I see comments in here in chat. Ah, my background has a, a lot of light. OK. How, yeah. How how is that? I hope is that better view? Eh? Yeah, that's better. Okay, thank you. All right. So all right, so that should be better. Uh, 
the I think the screen is challenging. Hello, colleagues. I think, okay. Is this fine? I think we are now good to go, right? Yes, Silva. Silva, I think you can only adjust your screen lower. Because yeah, it's, it's okay. That's okay. much better now. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. All right. So, really, FinTech are uh, technologically enabled innovations in financial services and this might include things like new business models uh, applications processes or products with uh, uh, with associated financial markets and institutions and really these are enablers uh, in financial services Examples here I've included Stripe, Ripple, Experian, Interswitch, MTN FinTech, Airtel FinTech, M-Pesa, ETC. Most people think FinTech is really about mobile money, but really that's like that's really the a very tiny component of FinTech. For instance, Experian is now was CompuScan in this market, which does credit scoring, create uh uh, alternative data and things like that. So before you get a loan, there has to be an entire like KYC process backdoor that has to be done to see or to ascertain who you are. So really that's uh, uh, FinTech in, in a nutshell. So it's systems, processes, business models, applications, and even financial products. And these can really be wide. It can be in credit, it can be in securities, it can be in uh, pensions, it can be in capital markets, it can be in loans across the entire spectrum of, of financial services. Uh, this is to be contrasted. I have a challenge though. The, uh, So this is different school and analysis to help you from school and stuff at least. So, so you'll find examples like Google has Google Pay, Amazon has Amazon Pay, Facebook, you'll see it trying to launch a variation such as Libra, you'll find Apple Pay, you'll find Alipay and such kind of services. Now, those are examples of tech fins. Yes, please. I think now we have lost the presentation. I think you changed the settings. I didn't change the settings. Uh, let me see what I can do. Sure, this is quite not smooth at all. Is it still lost? Yeah. You see that? No, you. You don't. Huh? It's 
still not visible. Not yet. Wow, this is. Maybe share the, share your screen. But that's what I'm sharing. So. Uh, Regina. Maybe first, first stop and then share again. Yes, Henry. I propose that he shares you shares his presentation with you, and then. We have it. I you did. Try, you, you try. We have you it. Try, okay, let's do that. Try sharing okay. it from the end. All right. Thank you. Is it still? How about that? No. Nope. We'll be sharing it. Shortly. Okay. All right. Huh. In the meantime, there is a question in the chat that maybe you'd want to answer. That is fintech shortened or an abbreviation for financial technology. Yes, that's true. Yes, fintech is a short form of financial technology. You will see all these lots of acronyms ending with tech. So even within fintech, you have others. For instance, you'll find insure tech, those are insurance technologies. You'll find prop techs, those are property technologies. I mean, sort of property listing platforms, portals, etc. You'll find reg techs, those are regulation technologies. Midway through the presentation, you'll see that um, even, tech, even regulatory bodies are coming up with sort of technology platform where you can do your compliance reporting and aspects like that. You'll find pension techs, those are pension technologies. Uh, mostly you'll find a lot wealth tech for wealth management services and, and aspects such as that. Yeah, I'm sorry, this hasn't been a very smooth experience at all. I don't know what's happening, but. I thought it would be relatively easy. Okay. All right, so we want slide three. Yeah, so just slide three, tech fins. I think that's, this should be slide. Okay, so no, let's go back. All right, yeah, there. So I had talked about tech fins, which are technology firms that are embed, that have embedded financial services in their products and business models. I had given examples of Google Pay, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, etc. You might also argue that the Ugandan self border is an example of a tech fin because this is a ride hailing company, but with a fintech uh, platform uh, on it. So you can have your wallet there, you can store your credit there, you can store your uh, money there. So that's when you hear the borders asking you, is it cash or credit? So that's what as an example of an embedded financial service within. Next slide. So FinTech exists in an ecosystem. When we talk of an ecosystem, really we mean these are the component features which make up uh, the service offering that we have here. So you'll have an example of the FinTech startups. I talked of payments, wealth management, lending, crowdfunding, uh, ETC. Then you have technology developers. Those are your big data. Those are your big data. ETC.
these are bugs, issuers. have government here you'll have your financial sector regulation. markets authority in the also those kind of things uh, next slide Both fintech industry is expected to grow by 23.14% and reach uh, 324 billion by 2026. Of course, it cannot go without saying of the acceleration effects of COVID, which has been a great boost to cashless and contactless payments, electronic money transfers and remote clearing and settlement. Of course, contactless payments were meant to sort of uh, limit uh, limit contact between people and surfaces, people and people, ETC, as a COVID mitigation measure. Next slide. Uh, back home in Africa, I think in early 2020, venture capital funding, these are private institutions and, le and lenders uh, who have sort of give early stage capital to fund startups. So venture capital funding for African fintech had risen by 51% with funding being generated for virtual banking project, consumer credit checks and finance apps. Later in the year, reports announced more growth. South Africa was the leading destination for the funding with 112 million in investments followed by Nigeria, Kenya, and then Egypt, which it's among the top 10 uh, liquid uh, ecosystems in Africa. The source you can access uh, via Next. So in terms of major trends impacting the ecosystem now, we are seeing increased innovations in banking as a platform. What that means is that banks are now it's also an insurance company through bank.
keep dropping off. DeFi means uh, finance. as well then there is wider final Um, I think Silva, I think we are losing you. Maybe you could um, stop stop sharing the video for us to get better, better this internet. internet connection because yeah. it seems. This one isn't really well. Can we give you two minutes to change? I think. Okay. Terror this. Okay, I hope I hope this is a better. It's still breaking from my end. Um, maybe those who are getting you clearly could give a thumbs up. The other alternative, you could turn off your camera.
it looks like silver has gone off we can just give him a minute to to get back in and maybe get a better connection Okay, I hope I've sorted it out once and for all now. Yeah, this, this should be a better connection. Uh, sorry. So, just waiting for the screen sharing to start. Yeah, okay, just let's share the, the screen. Um, I think we're having a bit of a challenge with the screen. Uh, let me try my end. Okay. Uh, first, uh, let's take off this. So are you having any challenges? Uh, so let me share the screen, I think. Uh, okay, can we see it now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Yes, it's clear. This should be sorted now, really. Okay, we had gone beyond that. Yeah, these are real third world challenges. Okay. Maybe you could use the slide share just for us yeah. to see cl more clearly. Anyway, you know what, I think let's Okay, is that better? Yes, it is. Okay, sorry, uh, this uh, hiccups. So uh, we've seen, of course, I talked about embedded finance in terms of uh, technological solutions and all, then increased pipeline of FinTech initial public offerings. These are really listings on the stock exchange. You saw firms like Jumia are listing even in other uh, markets, but also you see activity in Kenya but also in other uh, offshore countries, particularly in the United States. Then you see resurgence of mergers and acquisitions activity.
mergers and acquisitions is the process by which companies uh, buy or acquire others or merge uh, with other firms. Then improvements in open banking. Open banking means uh, sort of sharing infrastructure and information at a wider scale. So you see that adoption between maybe agent banking, you see uh, cash in cash out transactions from maybe your mobile money wallet to your banking wallet, ETC. But also you see more focus on B2B fintech business payment processing. B2B is business to business. Uh, what this means is two uh, business entities transacting in terms of payment processing, inventory management, financing, liquidity or float management, uh, ETC. So some of the continental drivers or factors are there from a, a macroeconomic perspective. You have 66% of people in sub-Saharan Africa are unbanked. You have 46 billion in remittances to sub-Saharan Africa in 2018. And this number is going high because you now see aspects such as externalization of labor to uh, I mean, Middle East, ETC, all those people will need uh, financial solutions to send money back home and fintech platforms such as remittance portals and apps tied to mobile money wallets are, uh, are natural solutions. You have 65% of the population is under 35. What that means is that the younger populations have a higher affinity for technological development and, and use. And then 4.5 is number of branches per 100,000 people. So that ties in with the unbanked or underbanked population that may need services such as uh, mobile money, ETC. And then you're moving towards mobile penetration on the continent. 80% Eight, of the population has a mobile phone. And then 36% internet penetration and this is growing the number might have changed from when this study was growing so what that means is that for you to interconnect people you need connectivity and if internet penetration is growing then that's a natural driver so this really has been the fintech regulatory evolution you started with too small to care in the sense that regulators did not really care these were very small platforms People did not know how big they would grow. Then you came to the too large to ignore. I mean, a fintech like mobile money now holds a third of Uganda's GDP. So that's too big to ignore. And soon we will move to too big to file. You'll find like if mobile money maybe holds like 50% of GDP, then you cannot allow such a platform to fail or to crumble. You will have to intervene, etc in case uh, of, uh, of challenges such as insolvency, challenges such as market failure. So some notable regulatory examples. Uh, in Uganda, we have the FinTech, the National Payment Systems Act, which is uh, the governing law now for FinTechs. One of the notable changes there is that you've probably seen uh, te uh, telecom companies having to separate their voice message and data caller services from the mobile money services so that they create a specific sort of uh, spin-offs to manage their electronic money business. Then Kenya, you'll have also the National Payment Systems Act 2011. You have Nigeria, they've issued the regulatory framework for mobile money services 2021 and guidelines on mobile money services. 2021. South Africa has the Financial Sector Regulation Act of 2017, which creates various bodies and which also regulate fintech. Yeah. In Ghana, you have the Payment and Services Act of 2019. And in Mauritius, you have the Finance Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 2021. This creates a framework for a fintech innovation hub and a digital lab in, uh, in, in Mauritius. Other laws and regulations such as capital markets, credit, data protection and privacy, anti-money laundering, tax, ETC are also applicable to fintechs. Uh, in Uganda's case, we have seen that uh, the schedule to the Anti-Money Laundering Act was amended 
to create, to sort of list, uh, to list uh, virtual asset service providers as accountable persons for purposes of anti-money laundering uh, reporting. Uh, so you have some, uh, since this is really a capacity building around tax, you have a notable advancements in tax. In Uganda, you saw the mobile money tax and that has been its journey. Initially came out at 1% and later reduced to 0.5%. Won't spend much time there, I think it's clear. Uh, you have Kenya, they have, that's their share of mobile Kenyan taxes on airtime and financial services, mostly in terms of excise duty on financial services and excise duty on airtime. I believe we all know what an excise duty is, which is really a tax mostly on services. Uh, so like the OTT tax in Uganda is an example of an excise duty. Uh, that's the example there in terms of the impact to Uganda social media tax led to user and revenue declines uh, in terms of tax impact. So you have your total OTT pairs and internet subscribers. Uh, we, we hope to see new data in terms of the new change that has come where the tax is now sort of embedded within uh, consumption rather than a tax on infrastructure. So these might also be seen, soon be updated uh, graphs and charts. Some other recent developments, uh, you've seen also South Africa having a 14% VAT on digital efforts in 2014. Uh, Tanzania, an annual licensing fee for content creation. You have Angola, a 14% VAT on digital services. Zimbabwe, VAT, Algeria, VAT. So most of the taxes have either been excise duty or value added tax. Then you also have other examples such as Benin that have also scrapped off uh, the taxes they had introduced uh, on these services. Uh, the point here to note is really that the tax impact is ecosystem wide. For you to have a stable sort of FinTech platform, you need an ID platform where you have uh, your national ID, your mobile number, you need a connectivity platform that can be fixed broadband or mobile internet. Most of the connections in the market are mobile. So you have your voice, SMS and USSD. USSD code is that code that you put in to send money or to, to access the service. And then of course you need a connectivity platform which is mostly credit cards, bank accounts, or in our market, really mostly it's mobile money. So ICT taxes weaken all these three platforms and disadvantage the poor because access becomes uh, more expensive. What do I see in terms of challenges for SCSOs? I see limited technical capacity, especially on the technology side. Typically, CSOs are not software developers, they are not app developers, and the education system does not inculcate aspects such as uh, tech policy and governance. So most of these things you have to learn on your own or take specialized training. I also see rigid regulatory systems which are still modeled on the industrial age or physical business approaches, thus stifling innovation. For instance, in Uganda now, to create a Forex Bureau, you need a physical business. Like people, BOU has to come inspect your office, see the counters you have, etc. Yet with FinTech, your Forex Bureau can be an online portal. It can be an online platform connected to a mobile money wallet where you cash out money after it's been exchanged at the prevailing rate which is published by BOU. 
There are weak institutional system le leading to delays in decision making, adjudication and feedback on queries. You'll find that uh, there are challenges, especially within the judiciary, um, in terms of laying down what the legal principles are. Uh, laws take very long in parliament to make and to review those kinds of challenges. Uh, just a minute, still here. You'll find cross-border complexities. Tech knows no borders. So if challenges come up in more than one country, you're dealing with a lot of cross-border issues and knowing which law to apply or which uh, dispensation works to resolve those particular problems or issues. But also technology is converging. I mean, there is all these platforms are multiple use platforms with various touch points. So that creates challenges, uh, shifting, sifting through those complexities to resolve the real challenges. And then of course you have politicization of tax policies. I mean, for instance, social media and the internet blockades, uh, those have particular challenges. Where are the opportunities for CSO? I think there is room for thought leadership, e.g. position papers on novel or new topics. There are topics that are emerging, topics such as taxation of crypto assets, digital assets, consumer protection, ETC, all those, there is an opportunity to create impact there and, sh and shape the ecosystem. Also rendering practical expertise, e.g. through sandbox interventions. Now, sandboxes are sort of controlled environments where they allow innovation to happen without uh, threatening uh, consumer protection. So if you have an idea and it's still new, you can put it in the sandbox where you work with regulators and even corporate departments, maybe in firms, etc., to make sure that uh, you make those uh, adjustments, uh, prototype reviews and things to make sure that the innovation is really fit for purpose. Civic tech, those are civic technologies that you need for people to communicate with decision makers, etc. Also cross-border partnerships to share experiences and best practices. All on the CSO side, there is opportunity to digitize or automate operations, e.g. payments, in order to leverage efficiencies. I mean, this kind of training as well is one example of that uh, process. New age activism on social media using analytics, influencer services, etc. Those are also opportunities for CSO. And then, of course, mitigating costs, budgets, e.g. through Zoom, remote work, etc. We would now probably be in a hotel, uh, maybe uh, with a conference or seminar, but we are doing this online in spite of the challenges we have with connectivity and, and all those uh, aspects. Uh, so I earlier talked of sandboxes, but in all this regulators are using different approaches to support innovation. Some innovators, some regulators have adopted a wait and see approach they are waiting to see how other regulators react, but also how the market reacts to these things. And then before they roll in with action. Of course, there is a test and learn. Some people are using this on case by case basis, testing the innovations and learning. Sandboxes, those are controlled environments to test. Waivers or exemptions, these are really issue, aspects that would be illegal or unlawful. But if you write and make a justification, you can get a waiver exemption to try the innovation and see if it works. Other regulators are using letters of no objection. So if you have, a, this is sort of a legal certificate. If you have an innovation and you want to test, you write to the regulator seeking a no objection and they give. Of course, you have differentiated regulation, which is usually confined in law and no need for subjective uh, decisions from the decision maker. And then of course, in other instances, you have regulatory reforms or legal reforms. 
where there is a whole enactment of new regulations and new laws specifically aimed at innovation. Uh, just going to go to the next slide. What's going on here? It's freezing. I see we have some comments. Let's see if there is any I can address at this particular point. Uh, I see probably one question, does it mean, does it mean that other ESC countries with the exception of Uganda and Kenya don't have FinTech laws? I mean, it's hard to find just one FinTech law because FinTech is sort of a, an amorphous word. So you'll find a series of other laws. For instance, you'll find central bank laws on payments. Rwanda has a payments law. Tanzania has a payments law. So all those laws can be applied to fintech. But also you'll find other communication sector laws, such as the equivalent of UCC. I know in Tanzania, they all have a law that governs mobile money as a value added communication service. So all, all those laws also have what you'd call equivalents of fintech laws as well. Uh, CRTD, Uganda recently launched a regulatory sandbox framework. Are there any gaps, stock threats to the taxation of fintech? Well, I mean, one of the most apparent gaps is that the sandbox, the Uganda sandbox framework does not provide for tax exemptions. It's not clear whether entities that are participating in the sandbox have to comply with other tax requirements or they, they are not. And if uh, an exemption is not given, then it cannot be implied. It has to be specific. So yeah, that's one of the challenges uh, that I see with that framework uh, of CAF. I think that's it with the questions for now. Uh, we go to the next slide that I have to share. Uh, of course, I earlier talked about regtex and how uh, regulators and also tax authorities are also using technological tools now to sort of tap into the fintech platform. IFRIS is one of the examples in Uganda where you have those uh, electronic fiscal receipts and invoices plugged into uh, businesses to sort of do VAT uh, tracking and paying instantly. Uh, then there is also another recent phenomenon uh, tied to fintechs, which is a policy issue. And these are uh, different countries are enacting startup bills or acts, particularly to support startups. You'll see Tunisia, Kenya has a startup bill uh, so the, how this is related to tax is that you have uh, different exemptions that are given to startups and other incentives in order to support business. Of course, the most contentious thing has been what is a startup. Of course, in Tunisia's case, you see it's a business which was created within the last eight months. It has less than 100 employees. It has revenue of less than 30 million to this year, dinner, ETC. So different countries are creating their own sort of startup laws to sort of boost uh, the ecosystem. Then there is also the aspect of central bank digital currencies where central banks are also creating their own sort of virtual currencies now, an example is Senegal, Tunisia as well. In Africa, you'll find South Africa has a whole distributed ledger technology, CBDC, uh, prototype that's running. Uh, also Nigeria, 
they are talking of an electronic daira. The idea really here is to centralize virtual currency creation instead of having uh, independent entities issue their own uh, crypto assets and cryptocurrencies. So really this is central banks asserting their own mandate over monetary policy. Of course, uh, this comes also with tax aspects around uh, how will the digital tax aspects emanating from these currencies look like. That's the opportunity size in terms of Africa's internet economy. It's uh, 180 billion to the future, mostly in connectivity, infrastructure investments, expanding tech ecosystems, e-commerce and fintech. All those have uh, tax touch points at points on which value is being created or being uh, passed on to other people. Scaling the future, of course, the story cannot be told without innovation hubs. Uh, the, of course, the tax aspect here being whether such hubs should be tax exempt in order to scale innovation. In Uganda, you have your own examples such as Hive Collab, Innovation Village, Design Hub, etc. Different countries also have uh, their own. You'll find them on that map. So in terms of recommendations a way forward, of course, there is really need for tax education reforms to sort of uh, mainstream these new economy demands into the tax curriculum. Relationships with industry players such as regulators and associations. Of course, the private sector understands the business and knows at the point which the value is being created, etc. So to effectively tax, you need to be in sync with the market fundamentals and then specialized dispute resolution mechanisms. Aspects such as digital tax, fintech tax are going to be mainstream disputes and these will require some specialized skills in order to be resolved. Periodic tax reform and updates to regulation. Of course, the economy is changing quick. And where mistakes are made, you need that periodic and quick review. For instance, the pace at which we reviewed the OTT tax and the mobile money tax to reduce it from 1% to 0.5% showed some level of proactivity in terms of, of course, it's a slow moving machine, but once you have sort of a framework, it sort of helps. And of course, before we tax, we need to do tax impact assessments. That is prior, during, and after tax. Before you roll out a new digital tax, do what would be the tax impact assessment. During the tax phase, you see how that should look like, and after. For instance, by now, we should have a tax impact assessment of what the OTT tax of 200 shillings per day meant to the system, how many businesses were promoted, how many businesses died, etc., that kind of, of arrangement. And then, of course, investment in digital transformation processes by both civil society and government, ETC. And then we could also move towards the Pan-African digital tax strategy. For instance, the African Free Trade, Trade uh, Continental Agreement talks about uh, the digital economy and digital trend. So it would be easier if you catalyze that, invest, that discussion to, to a continental framework in order to streamline processes and also create opportunities uh, for various bodies to learn from each other. Uh, in terms of conclusion, I think it is anticipated that FinTech will keep growing and use of efficient settlement systems such as smart contracts. Smart contracts are those self-executing contracts will be uh, widespread. I think we also have an immense opportunity to shape the future by modernizing tax frameworks to provide an enabling landscape and adopting enforcement frameworks and supervisory practices fit for 21st century digital economy. And then lastly is a call to action to catalyze impact by driving financial inclusion and facilitating economic growth and development. Thank you really financial inclusion is the heartbeat of fintech, reaching out to the unbanked, informal, semi-formal.
will help to widen the tax bracket. Then aspects. So where you widen the tax bracket, uh, aspects such as overtaxation will not arise. I think that's all from me. Uh, if there are any questions, they are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Silva, for taking us through the session, giving us up to speed to understand the fintech, fintech ideally, financial technology. I see some comments coming through from the chat. I don't know if you want to pick up from there before others can come in. Starting with Arubu. Arubu. Uh, Julius. Mm, one from Julius and then Andrew. Julius. To start up crypto business in Uganda, will this really yield results? Well, to the best of my knowledge, I think crypto in Uganda is recognized as a digital asset and not as a as a, as a legal tender. So I have not financial statement. I think really that's premature for me to make a statement at the moment because I have not looked at what the financial projections, what the business model ETC are. Uh, is there a research to affirm that the risks associated with what outweigh its benefits? What are the possible and practical mitigants in poor countries where financial literacy and other challenges are high? I think really the market knows what it wants. I mean, for the value preposition is that this is about convenience, it's about inclusion. Of course, aspects like mobile money of seen, they have challenges. Broad ETC, but that has problems they are say the dangers that come with it. So I think progressively as we move towards consumer protection and uh, our populations get more literate and tech savvy, some of these challenges will also reduce. Uh, both in scale, but I, I, I am not aware of any research to affirm the cost benefit analysis. Yeah, that's all I can say on that. Yeah, I think those are the only two questions I see for now. Now, any other questions from participants? Where we need clarity, NMP concerns, he has highlighted some of the issues that we take forward as civil society team. We've talked about the startup laws. I don't know if Uganda has one. Do we have a startup law? Hello? We have a startup law. We talked about countries no, not yet. Uganda, yeah. not yet. Not yet. Uh, Maybe the, what that means for for the economy as well as the issue around maybe tax tax incentives because we know that in Uganda we've had discussions where we've advocated for against harmful tax incentives and yet it would be fair enough to give some of the tax incentives some of our home based. Um, SMEs or enterprises. So yeah, also to other multinational organ the FDIs. I don't know. Yeah, I think the there is a process ongoing. They are reviewing the Companies Act, so it would be I think the right time to intervene, to focus the discussion there 
so that we have at least two tiers in terms of startup companies, but also the sort of the non-startup or the established businesses. Thank you for that clarity. Any other, any other questions? Participants, do you have issues you want to raise? Especially on the role of civil society in the ESC region. Maybe as others think about the questions, is there any link between uh, the threats, the threats hacking the internet systems? We talk about URA using to freeze the banking sector. Do you foresee you know, such threats and how those can be mitigated? Well, I mean, the industry standards are sort of set there regarding information security standards. So it's the usual encryption, passwords, etc. I'm not familiar with the end-to-end -end design of those systems, but I think they have security safeguards. And maybe where hacking happens, there should be some sort of remediation and quick prompt action in order to regain connectivity and aspects and, uh, and resolve the issue once and for all. We also now have a new regulator, the Data Protection Office, created under the Data Protection and Privacy Act, which is at NITA Uganda. So you see even entities that are leaving the market, such as AfriCell is exiting, they have to comply with sort of solid data destruction uh, protocols in order not to expose consumer data. So the same will apply for tax aspects in hands of private players. Okay. Do we also have a topic about um... The fact that now we see, like in Uganda, Uganda says that tax is now in the OTT, the tax is embedded in consumption rather than infrastructure. And our advocacy points is to see that uh, the companies are increasingly contributing to the tax revenue in jurisdictions. Do you, do you have any? any how this can be well, well, we we know that tax on services is an end user tax. If it's a consumption based tax, then it it's that. Uh, you also know the rules of domicile. So if those entities are not incorporated or registered here and for tax purposes, it might become difficult. So the idea is really to ramp up. See. Uh, where the, val the point of value, where it's being created, where it's being transferred and where it's being consumed. And then you can, have a, you can have a stable framework. And this has to be done in a holistic manner. It cannot be just on social media companies. It cannot just be on Netflix or streaming companies. Because ideally the principle should be that of same services, same rules. But does Netflix really render the same service such as DSTV? Does Airbnb render the same service such as Sheraton? I think there are differentiators that you need to look at. So we sort of need a harmonized digital tax strategy uh, that's uh, aware of us. And because we are mostly technology consumers rather than creators or developers, so the only tool that's quick for government is in terms of consumption tax. Okay, thank you. For I, that. I see a question from Alan. Alan says, can government raise revenue through taxing IP value chains? Yeah, I mean, Uganda has very comprehensive intellectual property laws from copyright to trademarks, ETC. And now under the new uh, Securities in Immovable Property Act, you can use intellectual property even as collateral for a bank loan. So I think at each of those touch points, government can 
can tax uh, those services. Only that really our IP generation services have been mostly in the informal sector. We have not formalized the music industry. Everyone produces what they want. The studios are not registered. The promoters are doing their own vivulu and things like that. So it's hard to track value if you're operating in such an environment. But as systems formalize, I think revenue can be there. Cybercrime, this is from Siatini. Cybercrime in regard to digitalization. Of course, cybercrime is a big threat, but it's also a big opportunity. There are cybersecurity firms that are also paying tax. Cybersecurity services also attract VAT if you're going to do IT audits and things like that. So I think preventative tools such as periodic IT audits software upgrades as continuous sensitization should be uh, encouraged, but that cannot be 100% foolproof. There will always be weak links that can be, uh, uh, that uh, can be exploited by cyber criminals. There is a comment from Alozia, you know if you saw it. Uh, where is that? The quick response to tax measures is needed, but in one way or the other, it affects doing business due to tax uncertainty. What's your take on that? For example, OTT in Uganda was 200 vis a vis of passing on internet data. I think everything has its pros and cons. Uh, 200 per day punished more of smaller consumers in terms of tax impact. If you are putting bond of 50,000 and paying tax of 2,000, your tax assessment is, your, your tax impact is very low. If you're consuming a bond of 500 shillings and paying a tax of 200, that's almost 50%. But with 12% on internet data, it's simple now. The more you consume, the more you pay, which is, I think, one of the principles of consumer-based taxation. The less you consume, the less you pay. So it really depends on which side of the divide you are. But from an, uh, a tax inclusion perspective and revenue generation, I think you're better off dealing with consumption percentages as opposed to fixed rates. Any other comments? Maybe you also made a, a submission that they need for us to review the tax laws annually. Uh, I think we call conductor. Not all the think tax assessments. But yes. We've seen that sometimes reviewing taxes on an annual basis sort of impacts on the attainity or creates uncertainty to taxpayers, which sometimes disadvantages, uh, of course, their plans. And we know that sometimes this is done, of course, from a good, they have good reason to review the tax laws. So how do we have a middle ground to see if that we are creating tax certainty, but also reviewing, that we're reviewing the unfair tax laws for the time? Well, I think tax laws are reviewed annually as is current practice. So, and uh, where like changes are to be made, you can just issue sort of uh, a guidance note or practice directive to say, we are reviewing this on aspects X, Y, and Z. So that once the next financial year starts, the market starts preparing in time as opposed to you like effecting a change and then you want to roll it out on 1st July. What other jurisdictions also do is that they create sort of transitional clauses. You say, yes, this will be passed this year, but it will come into effect within six months.
So, are you still there? I can't seem to hear you. So we lost him. I think he will be back. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yeah, I can now hear you. I think we lost Silver. Let's just give him a few minutes to... In the meantime, in case you have any issues, any questions you want to raise before we close, you can include them in the chat so that he responds to some of them. Tomorrow's session will be starting at 11 o'clock and we are trying to understand the link between the digital economy and trade issues. There is that nexus. There is a conversation that's going on at the World Trade Organization on how to tax the digital economy and get some of the pro proposals that are being put forward might make it hard for us to, to tax those multinational companies. So please join us tomorrow at 11, from 11 to, yeah. 11 to 12.30. Mm -hmm. Andrew, please mute. So that we continue with this conversation. I know Silva will be joining us shortly. Let's just give him a few, a few minutes. We shall be using the same link as well. And then on Thursday, of course, it's um, looking at bringing it back home to the East African region. What is the best tax uh, regime that we could uh, consider? Is it the VAT regime or the um, all income tax and why are ESC countries uh, shying away from imposing or living income taxes, direct taxes. On Friday, we'll be unpacking public-private partnerships and how we can uh, link that conversation to debt and um, among others. I don't know if Silva is back, he's not yet back. Anyone who has a submission to make? Any, I see there's a comment in the chat from Alan. Currently, the CAFTA protocol on e-commerce is being negotiated. What are those silent issues we believe must be addressed in this protocol to both enhance the area but also let the digital economy thrive? I think this is uh, a good question, which we could um, see how to unpack or discuss this further tomorrow at 11. Yes, Alan? Um, thank you, Regina. Me, I thought, anyway, I don't know. My network has been on and off, so I may have missed out on some of um, Silva's uh, submissions. But uh, fintech, digital economy, and e commerce is um, something that I believe there is a lot that um, is out there. And I really, really wanted to hear his thoughts on some of these issues. But um, uh, on the protocol of, on, on, on e commerce, I would really want to know where the intersection happens, where, because I had really asked about um, taxation of value chains along inter intellectual property rights and, and, and assets. So, 
and I don't know if you say this is going to be addressed tomorrow. I will try and make time tomorrow and, and, uh, and log in. But the idea here is that um, a lot is happening and I believe we could do some work around. And um, we would want to know because we cannot talk about FinTech without talking about innovation, without talking about um, intellectual property, without also talking about foreign direct investment. So that is where most of these converge. And that's why I was asking that, for example, if we are, if we are talking about influencing certain protocols and uh, negotiations in certain fact in certain areas, what are the silent issues that we could be engaging on and all that. But I look forward to tomorrow's discussion and I uh, hope Um, I think we lost Alan for a bit, but since Silva is back, maybe, Silva, maybe you could attempt to answer Alan's question ahead of just if you can try to, to, to provide a brief response. Okay, then, I think yeah. I can. I okay. had also two other questions. I think one was from... Smaya or sorry, the chat disappeared along. It was on. It was on. There was one on agriculture value chains, which yeah. I think is important because agriculture, of course, uh, value chains here. We are also looking at the fintech impact there. For instance, issues around the risking farmers if they have their own. Uh, credit platforms, village loan associations and circles, access to credit, ETC. So I think those are opportunities from the agriculture value chain, but also partnering with institutions such as uh, input providers, credit uh, facilities, those I think uh, are opportunities there. Then the other was on the FCFTA on e-commerce is being negotiated. What are those salients you believe must be addressed in this protocol to enhance DRM, but also let the digital economy thrive? I think to, one of the key aspects to me is cross-border cross -border sandboxes. For you to thrive, you need to be scaling in more than one market. But also we need to address issues of portability of regulatory requirements. If a startup is compliant in Uganda or in Kenya or in Tanzania, you don't have to be asked for the same paperwork to produce in all those countries. So through aspects like uh, mutual recognition frameworks and uh, regulatory uh, cooperation, in that protocol, we can drive a scale there. From an IP perspective, really, IPS has commercial transactions. For instance, transfers, you can transfer your IP to another person. Assignments, you can assign your IP to another person. And uh, all those transactions have royalties. So royalties are taxed differently. In Uganda, I think royalties fall under the Income Tax Act. So if you make those royalties, you must be able to pay income tax and therefore the government can tap from those services. We've also seen tax on in income tax on income from uh, music shows, ETC. In the past, we've seen musicians lined up and uh, their cars confiscated for not remitting. Uh, income tax. Uh, but yes, I think IP is definitely a game changer if we can monetize. The challenge is we are creating IP for open source. If you go, all of us are posting on social media, etc., but we are not monetizing. So if we can say like a certain portion of revenue adverts generated from Ugandan IP are taxable, then you can sort of have an incentive framework like for social media companies to disclose how much they have made off Ugandan IP and then can be able to remit a portion of that money 
uh, the way it's being done. But that will call for cooperation. You don't get that by blocking them or by threatening them. I think it has to be from a perspective of partnership and, uh, and respect of the rules of the game. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I see one question from Aloysius here. Uh, technology and digital economy is with us. At what level do you think the government should put effort to ensure that citizens acquire the knowledge? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that yeah, is a bigger discussion that has been there around educational reform. To me, I think it should be as early as nursery. But the good news is that some of these tools are no longer monopoly of uh, the state. Even you as a private parent now with e-learning, with all these uh, aspects that have come from online education, uh, you can take an initial step to make sure you're imparting the skills that you want to see. The state can't be everywhere. It can't be present. It can't be teaching young people not to consume pornography or <laughs> or post memes or things like that. So I think, yeah, education has a part, but also life skills uh, from our homes and domestic contexts is also helpful. Yeah, I think I've seen those questions, unless there is anything else. Maybe for my end, Silver. Yeah. We are talked about the innovation, the different categories of innovation, wait and see, test and learn, the sandbox, the waivers. Is there any, in terms of categorizing them, are there any disadvantages and opportunities or advantages, or is something that's to anyone who is trying to put up that innovation? Yeah, of course, everything has advantages and disadvantages. So the minor, adva the minor advantages, say, of sandboxes are once you've been whitelisted by regulator, is that the regulator gives you sort of a letter of comfort. So if you want to win partnerships, collaborations, you go with that letter to like a bank or the money remittance company to see you say, look, we are trying to do this in partnership with BOU, they've approved us. It makes the conversation easier. In terms of disadvantages is that if your product, the product you're developing is red listed, then the regulator is going to make the market aware. And if they make the market aware, definitely it will kill your innovation and no one will touch you. And also sometimes there are professional concerns around confidentiality of information and IP. You have submitted to those open innovation calls and things like that. It's how you hear of someone has submitted the idea and then someone else is executing it, etc. So not everything is within your control. From a wait and see perspective, definitely sometimes you might wait too long and, and uh, the market is exposed to a lot of bad practices such as Ponzi schemes or digital or, 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 or crypto scams. We have seen these D9, one coin in Uganda, ETC, where people have lost money. So if you wait, you, a regulator could wait too long and then things go really, really wrong. Uh, but also the advantage is that waiting and seeing helps you come up with a measured response if you're tracking the right risk and also uh, taking initiatives to understand the market better. That's, yeah, that's it. Thank you, thank you very much, Silva. I believe right. that uh, we've all learned a lot. In case there are any comments that uh, you want to share or feedback, I believe Silver can be direct in our social media and it's available in case. Yeah. Um, yeah.
I'm really, I'm really sorry. We had a lot of hiccups. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know what's happening to my connection, but yeah, I hope next time we can uh, pull this off better and easier without any hiccups and I'll be able to deliver a, a better experience than we have seen today. That's okay. That's yeah. adjusting with a new normal as well. Thank you to the participants who have made it for this uh, session. We hope to see you tomorrow, 11 o'clock to 12.30 and keep safe. Thank you, Silva. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Nice to be here.